Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 141, Dr. R.T. Mullins, Is God Timeless? Dr. R.T. Mullins earned an M.A. in Philosophy of Religion from Trinity International University in 2010, and in 2013 he earned a Ph.D. in Theology from the prestigious University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He has been awarded a visiting fellowship at the University of Notre Dame, and he has been a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and at the Northfield Mount Hermon School in Massachusetts. He's published about 17 articles and book chapters on topics such as life after death, panentheism, God's timelessness or temporality, divine simplicity, and the Incarnation. But he's here with us today to discuss his new book published by Oxford University Press as a part of their excellent Oxford Studies and Analytic Theology series. It's entitled, The End of the Timeless God. Dr. Mullins, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Mm, Thank you for having me. Dr. Mullins, in the introduction to your book, you say that at one point your working title for the project was In Search of a Timeless God. Why the change? When I first started working on this project during my PhD dissertation, that was the title of the dissertation was In Search of the Timeless God. And at the time I was I was thinking, I can't really accept the claim that God's timeless anymore, but maybe there's a way to make that work. Maybe there is still some view in logical space where God could be timeless. And then I discovered that that doesn't work at all. I could not find any view. And so when I went to to Oxford University Press with that title, they felt that this isn't a search for the timeless God. You're just destroying the doctrine. So you need to you need to come up with a new title. So I was like, OK, well, how about how about the death of the timeless God? Because that's like, you know, because I really like heavy metal and like that's really metal, you know. Uh, and Oliver Crisp, like he really liked the title. He thought that was great. But uh, the delegates at Oxford were worried that would be too much like the death of God movement. Yeah. And that's clearly not what I'm up to. And I was surprised because I didn't I didn't know the death of God movement was a thing anymore. So I was like, who would associate it with that? But so so they proposed the end of the timeless God in place of the death of the timeless God. And so, yeah, so then that's how the title got changed to the end of the timeless God. So it was a process of going down and finding dead ends. Yeah, something of that sort. Yeah, just, and, and then also this feeling of this is a doctrine that I felt was deeply incompatible with Christianity and with what a lot of what we want to say as Christians. And so I was like, we need to put to death this concept because it just it destroys Christian practice, it destroys Christian hope, and I think it destroys a lot of Christian doctrine. Dr. Mullins, as you argue in the book, if we're going to think about what the relationship might be between God and time, we first need to decide what we think time is. So what do contemporary philosophers think that time is? I think there's three really important questions that you have to answer in this regard. And the way you answer these three questions is going to have a huge impact on your overall systematic theology. The three questions are what's called the metaphysical question, the ontological question, and uh, the persistence question. And so we'll just go through each of those. So the metaphysical question is just what is time? The two main views on this are what's called a relational theory and an absolute theory. And so the relational theory says that time exists if and only if change exists, or possibly time just is change. And this is the most traditional view in Christianity throughout church history. This is the view that most, most Christians have affirmed, that time exists if and only if change exists. If you have a change, you have a time, because change creates a before and after. So the view is that time is not a thing? Yeah, it's just a relationship between changing objects. And any kind of change is going to get the job done. So it could be really exciting changes. It could be really mundane changes. So change from Dale was sitting and now Dale standing that is enough to create time on this view. So change implies the existence of time, but not necessarily the reverse. It's not necessarily that if there's time, there has to be change. Um, So the absolute theory is going to say that time can exist without change. And so that's where the difference is between those two, at least for for the purposes of, of this conversation, is to say on the relational theory, time exists if and only if change exists. There's this really tight connection between the two, whereas the absolute theory can say, well, look, time can exist without change. And there's a couple different ways of cutting that. So some people will say all you need for time to exist is the possibility of change. Mm -hmm. You just need some being that exists 
that could possibly undergo change. And that's all you need. It's just like the dimension of possible change. Mm -hmm. Another way to think of the absolute theory is to say that time is a thing that makes change possible. There's a lot of different weird ways to kind of cut that. But one of the biggest claims is time can exist without change. And so that's not as popular of a view throughout church history. I've only been able to trace that view back to the 1300s uh, with Nicole Orsami in the uh, Christian tradition. But that was famously Sir Isaac Newton's view. Right. Yeah, it becomes very popular during that time period. So Pierre Gassendi before him and then Samuel Clark and Isaac Newton and a bunch of others start really pushing this view. And it plays a big role in their understanding of, of God and the God-world relationship. During this time period with Newton and others, you actually see people saying things like time just is an attribute of God or it just exists because God exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some sort of necessary entailment of the being of God. So the ontological question is about what moments of time exist. There's a lot of different views you could hold with this regard, but there's three that are the most popular. So we'll just take us through those because we don't need to worry about the other views that no one really wants to defend. It's the most common view is called presentism. It's quite simple. It's just the present is the only moment of time that exists. Past no longer exists. Future does not yet exist. And those past moments, they did exist, you know, but they're just, they're no longer present. So the present exhausts all of reality. And this is the most widespread view throughout church history. And it plays a huge role in developing the doctrine of divine timelessness. So it's the most popular view with church history. Yeah, and you might say it's the common sense view as well. Right. A lot of philosophers, even those who reject it, will say, yeah, this is the most common sense view. And I'm not aware of anybody in the Western world really rejecting it until more of the modern era. I know there's some Buddhist philosophers during the Middle Ages that reject it. But in the Western traditions, I'm not aware of anyone who really, who really rejects it until the modern era. You might think that rejecting it is just rejecting time. I mean, there have been people that have claimed that time is an illusion. That's true. It's not part of reality. Yeah. I just, I just don't know what that means. I just find my life so utterly temporal that anybody who rejects it, I, I, I just feel the only response is an incredulous stare. Yeah. Somebody says that, you, you think to yourself, well, there was a difference between the start of your sentence and the end of it, so right. now what? <laughs> yeah. And then the very phrase, like, now what? Uh, like, it's, it's right. temporal as well. And we're like, what would you like to do now? Thank goodness that conversation's over. Um, yeah, I've got, it's just, my, my, my life is so thoroughly temporal. I don't know how to reject any, reject the claim that time exists. So I just find that it's quite odd. But this view is widely rejected among physicists, number one, Correct, and yes. especially among philosophers as yes. two. So what's the alternate view? Yeah. So the other two views are the growing block and eternalism. So the growing block view says that the past and the present both exist. And so it's this block of time that's constantly growing because as new moments become present, time is like the new moments are being added to this block of time. So all those past moments, they still exist, but the future does not yet exist, though. And then the other view, though, the view that um, has become much more popular, especially since Einstein, is eternalism, which is that the past, present, and future all equally exist. So all moments of time equally exist. And it's a very spatialized kind of understanding of time. To try to help listeners understand this a bit better, think of this. So I am not currently in Scotland, but Scotland exists. Even though I'm, I'm located here in New York, um, you know, Scotland still exists, even though I'm not located there. It's no doubt missing you. Yeah, it is, obviously. Now, um... <laughs> In January 1979, I'm not located there, but that moment exists on eternalism. I'm not located in the year 2525, but that moment exists. It's just as real as this moment is in 2016. So all these moments equally exist. Even if I'm not located there, they still exist. It's just a matter of perspective. It might seem that this one's more real than that, but that's just because that's where we are. Yes. So even though an eternalist will say past, present, and future all equally exist, they'll say, strictly speaking, terms like past, present, and future, those terms are perspectival. They're just from your own perspective in the same sort of way of here and there are perspectival. So I could be like, well, hey, why don't you come over here? And you could say, no, come over here. And we could like keep arguing back and forth about what here is. But here is just kind of re relative to wherever I happen to be placed. And an eternalist can say the same thing is true about terms like past, present and future. Since all these moments of time just simply do exist in a particular chronological order, but it's not really objectively the case that one is past and the other one's present and the other one's future. It's just some are before and after uh, and some moments are simultaneous. So they typically get rid of any idea of time flow Correct. or objective present. Yeah. So there's no flow to time. Uh, there's no objective present moment. When we talk about now, that doesn't have any special unique thing that it's pointing out. 
Yeah, and time is it becomes kind of a fourth dimension to the mm-hmm. cosmos. Yeah, you know, the three spatial dimensions and then past, present, future as a dimension. Right. So let's run a quick thought experiment to make sure that people listening can understand what's going on here. So imagine we're sitting in your living room and we are watching some really classy television, really high class television, you know, maybe like something like The Walking Dead or Pretty Little Liars or something, you know, just really, you know, high bar stuff. And as we're sitting there in your living room, we hear this weird sort of noise, this sort of like screeching, whirly sort of noise. And we're quite befuddled by what's going on. And then all of a sudden we see a blue police box appear in the middle of the living room. And a man in a sharp suit and wild hair pops out and he calls himself the doctor. And he says, here I have a time machine. And with this machine, I can take you to any where in space and any when in time. And so now we can ask ourselves, is this really possible? And it seems like if he can material... Is there anywhere to go? Right, is there where to go? Yeah. And it seems like, okay, like... Maybe he can't take me to anywhere in space because he's just like materialized in the middle of the living room. You know, like so that's a safe bet that he could probably take me anywhere in space. But can he take me to any win in time? And so like if presentism is true, can he actually take me to any win in time? And it seems like the answer is no, because like there's no past anymore. The present's the only moment that exists. And the future, well, that doesn't exist yet. So he can't take me to the future. So this doctor, this guy's crazy. He can't take me to any win. But you now, okay, but I'll get in, the, in, in, the, in this blue police box because he can take me to anywhere in space. So that's cool. But he can't take me to any win in time. Whereas if something like eternalism is true, where all those moments of time exist, then maybe he could take me to the past. Like maybe he could take me to the 1700s. And so I could see some sort of debate between Samuel Clark and, and Gottfried Leibniz over the nature of space and time. I could be like, hey, can you take me to that time, to the 1700s, to see this debate played out? Or I could be like, hey, could you take me to the 1700s so I could go, you know, flirt with the Princess of Wales because she really likes philosophy. And, you know, hey, like... <laughs> You know, who, you know, I've already gotten in with her. I can be like, hey, you like, you like talking about space and time? All right, well, there we go. <laughs> so these are things that the doctor could do if eternalism is true. So yeah, so those are, those are the three like, most popular answers to the ontological question about what moments of time exist. And, and so I want, again, for, I want to flag up for listeners, presentism is the most popular view in church history, and it has a huge impact on how Christians have traditionally understood the doctrine of God being timeless. Today, though, and we'll talk about this later, most people who want to defend divine timelessness today will affirm eternalism and say that all moments of time equally exist. So the eternalist thinks past, present, and future are all equally real. Presentist, only the present. And the growing block theory, just the past and the present. Correct. And sort of realities, they call it growing block because reality is getting added to as time goes on. Exactly. Because they do believe in a sort of a moving present like the presentist does. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So why all the hostility to what you might think is just the obvious common sense understanding of time? It has to do with uh, physics. Within the special theory of relativity... There's nothing within the theory itself that allows us to pick out the present moment. So there's nothing within the special theory of relativity that allows us to pick out what's called um, like a unique reference frame. And so some of the speculation from that is then led, well, if there's no unique reference frame, if there's no way to pick out the present moment, well, then there must not be a present moment. So perhaps all these moments are equally real. I don't really buy that. And there's a lot of different reasons why you might not buy that. One reason would be that the special theory of relativity isn't entirely accurate, and it doesn't account for all features of reality. For instance, it doesn't really talk about gravity, which is why we need something like the general theory of relativity. And the general theory of relativity, on some ways to articulate the general theory of relativity, again, you cannot pick out the present moment, but there are ways to develop the general theory of relativity where you can pick out the present moment. So it's not really clear that physics really does give us this knockdown reason against presentism. So for a lot of what a physicist does, they can definitely treat time like a fourth dimension. Yes. It's often visualized that way and and treated that way, but quite how realistically you should take that is a matter of dispute among philosophers of science, mostly, I would think. It really is, yes. So when physicists treat space and time as this this object, as this one thing, space-time, what they're doing is they are uh, simplifying their mathematical equations be they're ignoring certain facets of reality in order to make the equations more manageable and, and more easy. 
And if a physicist wants to do that, go for it because my goodness, those equations are really, really tricky and hard. And so if they want to make their job easier, that's fine. But when you're doing philosophy, though, you have to remember, oh, right, we did simplify certain things. We did ignore certain features of reality in order to get these equations just right. So when we're trying to get the full picture of the, of the way the world is, we have to bring in those other facets of reality that we've ignored. So the physicist John Polkinghorne, for instance, he's pointed this out a lot. He did a lot of work on quantum mechanics um, before he became a theologian. And so in his ideas, like, we have to remember that physics doesn't give us the whole story. And we do, are giving simplified equations. And if we're going to give a picture of the way the whole world is, we have to start bringing in all these other things that we ignored for a while in order to get a better understanding of just the physics. So things like causation, that doesn't necessarily play a big role in, in uh, fundamental physics, in our mathematical equations. We have to bring that back in. And according to Polkinghorne, if we can't find the present moment, so much the worse for physics then, because we know that there's a present moment in other scientific disciplines and in our everyday experience. So we have to bring in all these different lines of evidence to really get the full picture of reality. And if fundamental physics doesn't give us the full picture of reality, then so much the worse for it then. It's quite a radical picture, as common as it's become in science and as common as it is to modern people. I think a lot of people don't realize how radical it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've basically reduced change out of the picture. Change just becomes things or temporal stages of things or right. something, portions of space time being different at different lo temporal locations. Yeah. But, I mean, you could argue that, strictly speaking, there is no change. You can, but a lot of people who hold to eternalism, a lot of philosophers today who hold to eternalism, I should say, they really do want to say there is change going on here. Yeah. Change is objects having different properties at different times. They'll just say this is what change is. That's just what change is. Yeah. And I, and I feel like that's really important for theology to acknowledge this. If you want to be an eternalist and you want to affirm that God is timeless and use eternalism to develop that, you have to acknowledge that, right, there is a theory of change going on here on eternalism. There really is a difference between one moment of time and the next. And there really is supposed to be some kind of change that takes place between objects from one moment to the next. I tend to take the view that they've just preserved the talk of change and they've really gotten rid of it. You know, it's like sure. Buddhists theorizing about persons. Yeah. I mean, there are Buddhists that will tell you they have a theory about human persons. And, and in a sense, they do, but they've also either reduced or eliminated persons out of the picture. Right. Because it's all really conventional language about persons. Yeah. But the really, when you get down to the rock bottom, what's the real story? No, there are no persons. Yeah. So I'm willing to grant the eternalist and say, look, they, they, they say they've got change. Okay, cool. They've got change. Uh, they've got objects that undergo change in terms of having one property at one time and not having it at the next. You could get yourself into thinking that this view of time where everything's frozen in amber in this fourth dimension, mm. past, present, and future, you could just get yourself into thinking that this is just the God's eye view. Right. Come on, I mean, doesn't God just equally see past, present, and future in all their glory and all their detail? But then there must really be past, present, and future with every detail worked out. Yeah. You could get yourself to thinking that, well, if you believe in God, obviously you're going to have to be an eternalist. Right. And so that's what made this book so hard and so fascinating was that's, the, that's the, a lot of the contemporary view is this claim that God sees all of time at once. One of the common metaphors historically it's like God's uh, this guy in a watchtower, or he's a guy on top of a mountain, and he sees this road or a parade go uh, going on um, at the bottom of the mountain, and he can see the entire parade all at once. But what I discovered, though, throughout the process of doing the research for this book, is theologians historically in the church have said it's as if God sees all of time at once. And here's why they, they make a big deal as, uh, of the as if. Because on the traditional understanding of God, God is not dependent upon anything at all in order to be who he is and what he is and what he does. There's no dependency relation whatsoever between God and the universe. And so if God literally was perceiving all of time at once, then his knowledge of the universe would be dependent upon the universe itself. And the traditional understanding of God wants to say, no, 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 no. He cannot actually be dependent on the world in that way. So they very try to be very clear and say it's as if God were seeing all of time at once. His knowledge is based on, on having a perfect knowledge of himself. And that's how he knows all things. Yeah, and there's a long tradition in mainstream Christian theology of using metaphors for a very precise purpose and then immediately mm -hmm. throwing them away, not letting them become a model. Right. Just, we're just making this one point. Exactly. But don't take this seriously. Yeah. Don't draw any inferences yeah. from our using this metaphor. 
That's right. And what I what I noticed is that this metaphor gets used in the patristic era in the Middle Ages the, as as if God you know sees all of time at once. And then after Aquinas, theologians are really at pains to make make it clear that this is only a metaphor. It's as if God's seeing all the time once, but he's not really. They, they like they're more adamant to to really drive that point home more seriously because uh, because there was some confusion, I guess, that gets developed after Aquinas of thinking maybe all these moments of time really do exist in God in some weird sort of way. And so theologians are at pains to go, no, 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 no. That's just a metaphor. And maybe we shouldn't even use this metaphor anymore if it's just going to confuse people. So as we've discussed, Dr. Mullins, the two most popular views are eternalism and presentism, with probably a majority right now on the eternalist side. But which view do you think is correct and why? So I think presentism is the correct way to go. And I've got a lot of different reasons for this. The most like, serious reason, though, is just, it's just very intuitive. I always find myself existing at the present. I never find myself existing at some other time. The idea that all moments of time exist, I find to be quite detrimental to Christian theology. I've published on this before. I feel like it exacerbates the problem of evil. Because if all moments of time have equal existence, that means all those moments of past suffering are co-eternal with God. They just simply do exist with God. People who are located at those times of horrendous suffering, they never get to say, thank goodness that's over. They're just simply there suffering. In the book of Revelation, towards the end, it seems like God, God's pretty clear that like, he's like, look, I'm going to get rid of evil. There's going to be no more evil. There's going to be no more sin. There's going to be no more tears. And if all the martyrs of Christianity under the reign of Nero, they're still being lit on fire for his parties to serve as torches, they're just there suffering on eternalism. And so how can that really be the case that God's going to bring about an, an era where, well, there's no more sin, there's no more evil in the world. Oh, except for all those past bits where there's lots and lots of evil. They still exist. It's hard for me to understand how God really defeats evil in the end when there's all this evil and suffering that still exists in the universe, if eternalism is true. So evil gets discontinued, but that doesn't make it go away if right. eternalism is true. right. So like I said, there are three main questions within the philosophy of time that we have to answer for theology. The metaphysical question, the ontological question, and the persistence question. So a quick recap, the most traditional answers throughout church history have been to the metaphysical question that time just is change, or time exists if and only if change exists. And the ontological question, traditionally Christians have said, presentism is true. The present is the only moment of time that exists. So now this persistence question, how do objects persist through time? This has had a huge impact on how Christians have thought about the nature of God and, and God being timeless as well. So how do objects persist through time? I'll just mention two different views for today, even though I go through more in the book. The most common view is what's called endurantism. And endurantism is the, usually goes hand in hand with presentism. And Christians have historically affirmed endurantism. And so here's what endurantism says. Objects persist through time by existing as a whole or all at once. There's numerically one thing that is me. There's numerically one Ryan that has persisted through time. And I exist as a whole or all at once at each moment of, of my existence. And so there's just one thing that's me. That's it. And like I said, that's been the most traditional view throughout church history. The other view you could have on this is what's called four-dimensionalism. And there's a lot of different varieties of four-dimensionalism, but the main thing they all have is this doctrine of temporal parts. And so this usually goes hand in hand with the growing block theory or eternalism. The doctrine of temporal parts, it's kind of similar to, it's supposed to be analogous to spatial parts. I have very spatial parts. I take up space and I'm sp spread out through space. So my feet, they're located on the ground. My back is located, you know, up against this chair that I'm sitting in. And so I have these different parts of me that are spread out through space. Now, a four-dimensionalist is going to say something similar is going on with time. Somehow I have these things called temporal parts. There are parts of me that exist at different times. So I was born in 1983, and so there are parts of me that exist in 1983. 
and there are parts of me that exist at each instant of my career, of my existence. One way of understanding this is there is the Ryan that exists in 1983, and there's a numerically distinct Ryan that is sitting here in this room in front of you. And there's supposedly a, a numerically distinct Ryan at every single instant of my existence. That's a lot of Ryans. It is. Right. So, so people are listening to this podcast. They might be going, well, I guess I, I thought I was listening to just one Ryan. But, you know, depending on how, how long this podcast is, I guess I've been listening to, you know, a, a, a really large number of Ryans. My goodness. That, that, that there's so many of him. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Tens of millions, at least. Yes. And, and, and then it's, there's something glorious about that, I guess. Because, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty awesome. So more Ryans, the better. But... <laughs> But that is something that's intu- unintuitive about that. This idea that there's all these different temporal parts uh, going around, and just all these different Ryans running around, that's, that's, that's quite shocking. It would be, strictly speaking, false to say that I was speaking about time five minutes ago. Correct, because that would be a numerically distinct Ryan that's doing that. He has a very interesting relationship to me. There's a lot of interesting causal relationships between us, and we have a lot of the same beliefs and memories and so, and so on. But it's not numerically the same me. I find this really troubling Uh, as a Christian, to affirm this. Because if that's true, then I don't know how I have hope for the resurrection. I don't know how I have hope for life after death. Because the temporal part that is is speaking to you at this moment is eternally stuck at this time. The Ryan that gets resurrected in heaven, assuming I'm going to go to heaven, um, Lord willing, that's a numerically distinct Ryan from me. I have no hope for that. I'm stuck here in this office at this time for ever, ever and ever amen. Whereas a later temporal part of me gets to enjoy heaven. Now, wouldn't the four-dimensionalists, a lot of them say that Ryan is the totality of all these temporally momentary located Ryans put together? The whole thing is Ryan. Yeah, and so this is what's called worm theory. The whole thing... Sorry, man, you're a worm. I know, I'm just this this lowly worm. Oh, worm that I am, you know, uh, (laughs) if I was going to be a good Calvinist. Um, So, yeah, so so they say these sort of things, but then they'll also talk about how the worm is composed of person parts. Or sometimes uh, they'll refer to them as like subpersons. We should explain the worm thing because it's not yeah. what Calvinists mean when they say right, what, of they're a terrible yeah. sinner. It's... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm being slightly cheeky there. <laughs> so yeah, so when a Calvinist says, "Oh, worm that I am," they're talking about like the, you know how sinful or depraved I should say their yeah. uh, human nature is. Whereas when a four dimensionalist is talking about a worm, they're talking about how like like earthworms like they're spread out through space. And so I'm kind of like that because I'm spread out through time. So I'm this space time worm. And so I've got all these different parts of me that are spread out, but you put all the, you smash all those parts together and you get the one object you can refer to as Ryan. Yeah. You're this subset within space time. Yeah. This object, a four dimensional object. Yeah. And I'm an object that has parts located at different times. Whereas another view in four dimensionalism is called stage theory. And so they'll say that, no, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So you could say there's this, so there's all these different temporal parts kind of smashed together that somehow make an object Ryan. And they're going to be like, well, but no, the temporal parts are the things that's doing all the work. So we should say there's the Ryan at that instant, the Ryan at that instant, the Ryan at that instant, and so on and so on. So they're going to deny that there's this one overall object that is Ryan because they're going to say it's just the temporal parts. Interesting and related to one another, but that's it. And the worm theory is going to say there's one thing that's me, supposedly, but it's all just these temporal parts smashed together. So will I get to go to heaven if worm theory is true, there's a sense in which space-time worm that is Ryan gets to go to heaven because he has parts located that at His the... latter-day portions are... Yeah, but I, the one talking to you, am the temporal part that exists at this instant. So yay for, you know, the space-time worm Ryan that he gets to enjoy that. But I, the temporal part that exists at this instant, I have nothing to look forward to. I have no hope. This is utterly hopeless. And I, you know, I don't want to feel that hopeless today. Dr. Mullins, many Christian theologians have claimed that God is timeless, that he is, so to speak, outside of time. But this is clearly just a metaphor. Time isn't literally a place such that someone can be somewhere else instead. Help us to get beyond the metaphor and understand what do they mean when they say that God is timeless? 
Right. So now that we've got all those pieces of the puzzle about what is time, now I feel like we can actually say, what do Christians traditionally mean by God being timeless? So, like I said, they held to the relational theory of time, that time is just change. So part of what it means for God to be timeless is to say, God does not undergo any change. Another claim that they make is that God exists in this present moment, but it's a timeless present. God exists as a whole or all at once. So you can see the endurantism claim there. So God exists as a, as a whole or all at once in this timeless present that lacks a before and after. And so this is a traditional claim. And I can unpack that in a slightly different way to make it a bit easier to understand. Um, but that's how all those pieces to get, fit together. A timeless present sounds like a contradiction. It does. And so um, going back at least to Plato, philosophers and theologians have said, okay, well, when, we, when we talk about this timeless present, we need to make sure that we're getting rid of all of our temporal thoughts here. And this has a huge impact on Christian theology. Um, theologians are constantly trying to say, like, speak of God only in the present tense. And then when they let their pens slip and start talking in terms of like past tense or future tense, they're like, ah, well, we really mean just this, this timeless moment. It's just there's this one instant moment, but shouldn't think of it as a t- temporal moment where God exists. So it's something like a moment in that a thing can exist all at once Correct. Or, or completely exist there. Yes. And then they're adopting the present tense as yes. they think the least misleading way of talking about mm-hmm. what is really timelessly. Correct. So. Yeah. So that's, that's how those pieces kind of fit together. Here's a, a, a bit more clear way to, to, to unpack this without some of those pieces, but I feel like those pieces are really important to understand. So Christians want to affirm that God is eternal in the sense that he exists without beginning and without end, but he's timeless in that he exists without succession. He doesn't have one moment of his life after another, after another, after another. So you and I, we, our lives undergo succession. We have one moment and then in the next and then the next. Whereas God, like I said, he exists in this timeless present that lacks a before and after. He doesn't have new moments in his life. It's just this one eternal, timeless state of affairs. He lives his whole life at once, yes, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. And so that's where the endurantism comes in, is he exists as a whole or all at once. And since there's only this one timeless present, this only one, this present timeless moment, he exists as a whole all at once at that moment. Now, I think the person who hasn't had a lot of philosophy or historical theology maybe isn't going to quite realize how radical this claim is. If you're timeless, you're changeless. And that doesn't just mean that you don't get old. It doesn't just mean that you don't die. Right. It doesn't just mean that your character is dependable, that we can rely on you to keep Mm -hmm. your promises and things like that. It's just no no change of any sort, of any kind, of any degree. Correct. Not, Not even, you know... He's thinking one thing at one moment and another thing at another moment. Right. None of that. None of that. Right. All his thoughts he has at, at, at once. All his actions, any actions he performs, he does all at once from this timeless moment, from this timeless present. Dallas Willard had an interesting phrase. I don't know if he had a really developed view about God and time. I mean, he's something kind of similar to an open theist in some ways, but he would deny that. But. Uh, he, he uses the phrase of thinking about God as a cosmic, unblinking stare. <laughs> sure, yeah. I just think that he meant a totally static, mm-hmm. utterly unchanging thing, kind of like an abstract object. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, if you believe in things like circles or the number two or platonic properties, they can't change in any respect in any fashion. Right. And that's all true about God, except uh, I sh- to be fair to people who defend uh, the claim that God's timeless, They usually don't like the language of static because today in contemporary theology, static basically means those views that I don't like and relational (laughs) means those views that I do like. So if you accuse someone of having a static view of God, just, you know, it's just the worst insult you could possibly have. Uh, So he instead we want a dynamic view of God, whatever that means. And usually no one actually explains what that means. A lot of contemporary defenders of divine timelessness will say, we don't have a static God. We have a dynamic God. He's so dynamic that he does all of his actions all at once. And that's how dynamic he is. I don't think that means anything, but, you know, but I do want to lay that on the table that they they do not want to affirm that God's static. Fair enough. They they might have the idea that that suggests that God is impersonal or totally unresponsive or not involved in creation or something like that. And I understand this because traditionally Christians have wanted to affirm that God's completely timeless and changeless. But they also have wanted to affirm that he does interact in the, in the world. He does answer prayers. He does enter into covenantal relationships, you know, all the whole shebang because they're reading their Bibles. And so I want to I be really clear that, yes, classical Christians have affirmed all those things. 
I think, though, that it is a deep inconsistency between divine timelessness and God interacting in the world the way the Bible says. But Christians have historically affirmed both. And people who uh, defend divine timelessness today, they affirm both. There's one other claim that Christians have historically wanted to make about timelessness. So they want to say he exists without beginning, without end, and without succession. But they also want to say in order to really be timeless, he has to exist without temporal location and temporal extension. So he's not extended through time like I am because I persist from one moment to the next to the next. And I'm also located at all these different times. I'm in time in the sense of I'm located now. Christians have historically wanted to say God exists at a time, but he's not in time. It's not really clear what that means. And in fact, Rory Fox, who is a medieval scholar, uh, he points this out in in one of his books on uh, on, uh, the nature of time and medieval philosophy, saying this is a a claim that gets made a lot, but no one ever really develops what what it means for God to exist at a time, but not in time. But all the theologians are quite clear, though, that God does not have temporal location. He's not in time. And again, this is a disconnect, I think, from how a lot of ordinary Christians think about it and what's in the mainstream theological tradition. Recent Christian philosophers like Nicholas Walterstorff and others distinguish two different understandings of divine eternity. Correct. And they distinguish between timelessness and everlastingness. Yeah. So everlastingness is there isn't any time at which God doesn't exist. Correct. He always has existed, exists now, and always will exist. And you might think timelessness means he never has existed, doesn't exist now, and never will exist. Right. But exists timelessly. Correct. But, I mean, are they kind of, in a sense, papering over how jarring that is by saying he, well, it's at a time, but not in a time? I think so. Um, One of the things they're, they're trying to capture several different things. One, they're trying to paper over it. But another thing they're trying to capture with this at a time, but not in time, is Christians have historically wanted to say that our time exists in eternity. Because our time, our present moment, syncs up with God's timeless present. And part of this is related to the doctrine of omnipresence, that God's present everywhere. And also it's grounded in the claim that God sustains each moment in existence. So God's constantly sustaining the universe in existence. And he can only do that from his timeless present. So it has to be the case that our present moment syncs up with his timeless present if he's going to sustain us in existence and be omnipresent to all of space and time. So there's a lot of different kind of moving parts here that, um, that to fill out this picture. Yeah, I mean, if God is timeless and God God's the ultimate reality, and he and God is the source of the cosmos, then mm-hmm. yeah, in some sense, the temporal world has to be based in timeless reality. Correct. Sure. This trying to kind of quasi sync up mm-hmm. the present moment with divine eternity. That's that's where. Yeah. We start to get a headache. It, it is. Um, but I, I want to try to unpack the intuition a little bit. So presentists will usually say the present moment exhausts all of reality. So there's no things that exist at other times because there are no other times. So anything that exists, exists at the present. Mm-hmm. So for instance, John Philoponus, who is this Greek theologian from the 600s, like he's going to say, that's right. So God has to exist at the present. And then he kind of takes it back and is like, well, actually, we should say it's better to say that, that we exist at God's present. So this intuition that the present exhausts all of reality, well, then this timeless present exhausts all of reality as well. And in fact, everything's grounded in this, this timeless present. So the intuition there is, is, kind of, is, is really trying to get at this idea that the only things exist at the present. And since God exists, it has to be the case that God exists at the present. But he's not in the present, though. He exists at it. Dr. Mullins, given that this is a difficult to understand view, it has many different motivations, mostly I would say philosophical and Mm -hmm. from theological tradition, going back to the Platonists, given that it's a difficult view, why has it been such a popular view among Christian intellectuals? I think it has to do with our intuitions about what makes a being perfect. 
So there's a long tradition of what's called perfect being theology, which I still uh, I still want to affirm. I want to say that God's a perfect being, and I think it's the method of perfect being theology is a, is a good way to fill out our concept of God. But I feel like we have to let the Bible kind of critique and check our intuitions about what counts as perfection. Historically, this idea that anything that changes can't be perfect. So this is a sort of platonic principle that says all changes are for the better or the worse. Right. It's in yeah. Plato's laws, I think. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and so this is qu- quite quickly applied to God. So if God changes, th- then that would obviously be for the better or the worse. And if he's perfect, well, he can't get worse because then he wouldn't really be that perfect, would he? And if he gets better, well, well then he, wouldn't, he wasn't that perfect to begin with. And God's obviously perfect, so God has to be completely and utterly changeless. And so that's one huge motivation is this intuition about perfection. And there's other motivations going on here. And I can get into those in a second. But, but yeah, that's, 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 that's the one big one. But that's such a whopper. I mean, why, like, <laughs> why, why can't there be a greatness neutral change? I mean, you might think that greatness supervenes on a being's essential mm-hmm. qualities. Right. But those can't change if it still exists. Yeah. A thing can't change its essential properties. So why can't there just be value neutral? It's always been a head scratcher mm-hmm. to me, like why Plato thought this was obvious. Yeah. But then once Plato said it, well, well it's got to be true. Plato said it. Yeah. I mean, you think you're better than Plato? I right. don't think so, man. A funny method for Christians. It is. And I don't know what to do with this. And so, and, and this is what I found fascinating is Christianity gets objections based on this all the time. So when Christians start affirming the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, which says that there's a state of affairs where God exists without creation, Christians get hit with this all the time going, well, then that means your God is changing. So your God's not perfect. You silly Christians, you don't, you don't believe in a perfect God. You believe in this God that, that undergoes change. And so Christians historically have gone, no, 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 we can still have an account where God doesn't change at all. He's still timeless. He's still perfect. And so they're really put on the back foot instead of going, hey, why don't you change your intuitions about what it means to be a perfect being? That, that, didn't, that didn't happen uh, yeah, in the early church. Yeah. Instead, it was, oh, no, we still affirm that God's perfect in this sort of way. And then from there, they start trying to draw out other sorts of arguments. One kind of claim would be, look, I want to have a sure and secure foundation for my faith and for my happiness and for my salvation and an unchanging reality, an unchanging being. That is a sure foundation for my happiness. God is the source of happiness. In fact, God's identical to happiness itself. And do you really want a happiness that can change and that can fleet and like that could go away? No, of course not. No. So, I mean, there's a lot of these, these intuitions about perfection and, and then start, and start teasing these out in a million different ways. This is all at play prior to Christianity. And then once Christianity gets them up and running, they inherit a lot of these thoughts. But so long as God is unchanging in his character and promises, that's good enough for us, right? Well, so there's an, another assumption at play here that has to do with modality. And modality is about uh, the nature of necessity, contingency, possibility, these sorts of things. So, for instance, a necessary being is a being that cannot fail to exist. It's a being that has to exist. And a contingent being is some being that doesn't have to exist. It can exist, but it it could possibly fail to exist. You and I are contingent beings. Yeah, yeah. I didn't always exist. I came into existence. Uh, Lord willing, I will, you know, continue to exist forever and ever. Amen. Um, But I'm a contingent being because of that. And so traditionally, we want to say God's a necessary being. You know, he has to exist. So there's this intuition about modality, though, that we don't really share today anymore as philosophers. But um, prior to Christianity, there's this assumption that necessity entails immutability or changelessness and that contingency entails mutability. So if some being could change, then it's obviously contingent. And there's loads of arguments throughout the Christian tradition that just jump so quickly from, well, God's a necessary being, so therefore he's completely and utterly changeless. And it happens so fast, and you're like, what's going on here? Well, if you understand this modal assumption that's in the background, then some of those arguments start making sense. So, yeah, if if a being is necessary on their understanding with their assumptions about modality, it has to be completely and utterly changeless. Because if it changes, well, then it's clearly a contingent being. These are basically Aristotelian assumptions? Yes, this is an Aristotelian assumption about modality. Yeah. And has a huge impact on Christian theology and a huge impact on um, objections to from outsiders, pagan philosophers objecting to Christianity, going, look, your God has to change in the act of creation. Well, therefore, your God's not perfect. Therefore, your God's contingent. And therefore, your God has to be created by a more perfect being. Yeah, and it is an interesting point that philosophers have just completely left this behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just not a part of thinking about necessity and contingency now. No, not at all. 
And that I find really fascinating because I think that's where a, a huge disconnect is in contemporary theology, theology today, where you've got all these analytic philosophers of religion going like, look, you know, God has these essential properties. He's perfectly good and he can't cease to be perfectly good. And then you'll have theologians on the other side objecting going, well, but he changes from one thing to the next. And you're like, well, yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, then, then he could cease to exist. And you're like, what are you talking about? I said God was a necessary being and he's necessarily perfectly good, um, but he does one thing and then he does another. How did I get to all of a sudden God could fail to exist or God could stop being good? Like, it, 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 and, and so I think a lot of contemporary theology doesn't realize they have not, they have not identified their modal assumptions here. And so it's not being laid out on the table of, hey, here are our assumptions. Are these assumptions good? Same thing with our perfect being intuitions. A lot of theologians today don't want to just lay out their assumptions on the table and go, okay, here are my intuitions about perfection. Are these the right uh, intuitions to have? Should I test these? You take your chances when you leave your philosophy to fourth century bishops. That's true. Yeah. You really do, because some of them are good at it and some of them aren't. Yeah, it is a grab bag. Um, and then sometimes, you know, some of them, they say good things. And then other times uh, the same bishop will say something just outrageous. And you're like, Woo, OK, well, right. These are fallible human beings. I want to listen to them. I want to learn from them. But I do need to remember they are fallible. They're not omniscient. Dr. Mullins, in our episode next week, we're going to talk about your reasons for rejecting this classical understanding of timelessness and even some of the related attributes. You're not the first person to reject these. What other theologians have wanted to revise their understanding of God and time? These objections to uh, the, this Christian doctrine of God as timeless, they go back to the very earliest of days. And so these objections have always been there, I think, from the laity and from students. So this is not a new thing, but you don't, I don't really see any major theologians rejecting it until maybe after the Reformation. There's people like John Tillotson, Isaac Newton, Samuel Clark, and the like that reject this traditional doctrine that God's timeless. But the doctrine of divine timeless has prevailed. And, and so it's not really until I get to the 20th century where I see a widespread rejection of this doctrine. Basically, in the 20th century, there's a, the story of theology is a complete mess. Theologians are wanting to do everything they can to reject the traditional doctrine of God. People like Karl Barth, Eberhard Jungel, uh, even T.F. Torrance, and all the process theologians. Uh, I mean, it's it, feminist theologians, disability theologians. I mean, everybody's wanting to try to come up with a new, better understanding of God. So it's really in the 20th century where you see this widespread rejection of the classical understanding of God. Dr. Mullins, thanks for talking with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Again, the book is The End of the Timeless God. I'm happy to say that next week we'll again talk with Dr. Mullins about his views on what is nowadays called classical theism, which is also discussed in this deep, carefully argued, and clearly written book. This week's thinking music has been Blue Like Venus by Spinning Merkaba. I got a nice piece of feedback this week from Michael, who's a graduate student at the University of Oxford. He says in part, quote, I want to express my appreciation of your work. Your challenge to quote Jesus is God episode garnered quite a stir among the postgrads here, which is how I discovered the podcast. I thought you might enjoy knowing that your work garners interest for better or worse among the student body. Personally, I'm grateful to see early Christian thought engaged with the full rigor of contemporary analytic tools." End quote. Michael, thank you very much. I appreciate the feedback. Of course, I'm delighted to know that PhD students in theology, or maybe in philosophy, or the history of theology are listening to the podcast. And I hope that some of them will give some response to that episode you mentioned, which is Podcast 124, a challenge to Jesus is God apologists. There's an argument there which I claim that thinking Christians should have a response to. I have got a few responses to it. I'm looking for more. I hope to do at least one follow-up episode on that sometime before the end of this year, but probably not before the end of the summer. Again, Michael, glad to have you listening. Thanks for your helpful feedback. I appreciated your whole letter. If you'd like to send me some feedback, that's easy to do. You can find my email in many places. You can message me on Facebook, or you can leave a comment at the Trinity's blog. 
Before we go, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and so on. For listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>